Hi, my name is Sean Patel and I'm from Duke University. I'm also a developer for the Internet to Gruber project. This is the developers and architects track of the Gruber training. In this video, I'll be talking about how developers can use LDAP for group information. Here are the topics that I'll be covering in this video. I'll start off with an introduction, then I'll talk about some of the advantages and disadvantages of using LDAP for groups. I'll talk about flat, flat versus bushy structure and various ways that group data may be reflected in your LDAP. Then I'll give some good practices on performing LDAP queries. Here's an architecture diagram of Grouper as a version 2.1. The component that's circled here in red is LDAP slash AD. LDAP stands for Lightweight Directory Access Protocol. Uh, directory servers typically have entries created within them, uh, typically in some sort of organized hierarchical structure. There may be entries for people, uh, groups, and various other types of objects. For instance, each user at your institution may have an entry, and that entry may have multiple attributes associated with it. The attributes may include the person's name, affiliation, email address, phone number, group memberships, and so forth. The LDAP protocol, being a, a common standard, is often supported by applications and vendors. Uh, next, AD stands for Active Directory, which is a Microsoft product uh, which supports the LDAP protocol, among other things. But there are many other products that support LDAP as well, including OpenLDAP and the Oracle Directory Server. Depending on how your institution has deployed Grouper, group information in Grouper may be reflected uh, to LDAP using the Provisioning Service Provider, or PSP. The way that groups are provisioned in LDAP largely depends on how the grouper administrator at your institution has set up provisioning, um, has set up the provisioning configuration. In this video, I'll cover some of the ways that you may see group data in LDAP. Here's the sample structure for how groups and people may exist in a directory. In this example, the base DN or distinguished name is dc equals example, comma, dc equals edu. DNs are unique. Under that, there are two OUs, which are OU equals people and OU equals groups. OU stands for organizational unit, and they help to organize your hierarchy. It's often common to create OUs within OUs. And then finally, you would have entries that would reflect the people or groups. In this example, all people are directly under OU equals people, um, that one single OU. Uh, but it's also common to have sub-OUs under OU equals people to reflect your organizational hierarchy at your institution. So here there are two entries under OU equals people. They are UID equals Bob and UID equals John. Uh, the full DN for Bob's entry is UID equals Bob, comma, OU equals people, comma, DC equals example, comma, DC equals EDU. The UID equals Bob portion is known as the RDN. You can really use any attribute of the entry as the RDN, uh, but folks typically use uh, CN or UID for people and CN for groups. CN stands for a common name and UID is the user ID. So aside from the UID attribute, Bob's entry contains other attributes like given name, surname, display name, and member of. The attributes that you're allowed to have in a given entry are based on the object classes that are added for that entry. Object class is just another attribute that exists on entries, but I haven't reflected them uh, here. The member of attribute is used to store the DN of groups that the entry is a member of. So you can see that CN equals staff, comma, OU equals employees, comma, OU equals groups, comma, DC equals example, comma, DC equals EDU is an entry that exists below. Uh, for the group example, the RDN that we're using is CN. The staff group has a description attribute along with a member attribute. The member attribute uh, reflects the DNs of objects that are members of the group. So you can see that Bob's entry is one of the values. So this was a very brief intro into LDAP that's hopefully sufficient for this video. So next I'll talk about some of the advantages and disadvantages of using LDAP.
Because it's a common standard, many third-party applications support LDAP integration out of the box. So if you're dealing with an application that you've bought, having the application talk directly to Grouper may be difficult to do. But if all the groups in Grouper are in LDAP, it may be much easier to have the application talk to LDAP for groups. Another advantage of using LDAP is that if it's deployed properly, you usually get great read performance out of it. And it's also relatively easy to make high available. Uh, but there can be disadvantages as well. If Grouper is your source for groups and the directory is just a presentation of it, then using LDAP is going to be read-only. Uh, so if the application needs to just read group data, then that's fine. But if it needs to make updates too, then those updates probably need to be directed at Grouper instead. Also, another disadvantage is dealing with privileges as far as which LDAP users can read which groups. Some institutions have reflected privileges in Grouper for groups into LDAP as well. Others deal with privileges in LDAP separately. Here are two example structures for how groups may look like in your LDAP. The first one is flat, where all groups are directly under one OU. In this case, the CN attribute, which is used as the RDN, uh, contains the full group or group name or ID path. The second example is the bushy structure. This is similar to the example I was showing in the introduction. Here, each OU within OU equals groups represents a folder in Grouper. The value of the OU is the folder ID in Grouper. Group objects within OUs um, are similar to how groups are within folders in Grouper. Typically, the CN would be the group extension or ID. The bushy structure is similar to the hierarchical structure that you would find in Grouper. Um, if you're not clear on which structure is used at your institution, you should probably ask your Grouper administrator for how they've set things up. Now I'll mention how group and member objects may typically look like in an Active Directory. Starting with group objects, the object class that is typically used is simply group. The SAM account name attribute is a unique attribute in the AD. Depending on how the LDAP sync is configured, it's possible that the SAM account name is randomly generated uh, by the AD, or it may be a value that's created as part of uh, the provisioning. For instance, at Duke, our SAM account name value um, for groups contain the group name, but we replace colons with hyphens since colons aren't allowed in SAM account name values. Finally, uh, you would probably have a member attribute that would contain the DNs of subjects that are members of the group. As far as member objects, they would probably have a member of attribute that contains the LDAP entry uh, DNs of groups that each subject is a member of. In AD, the member of attribute is a computed attribute based on uh, the group objects, so the member of attribute is not provisioned separately. Now I'll give an open LDAP example based on the default open LDAP PSP configuration. Group objects would use the group of names object class uh, with the default PSP configuration though it's possible to use the group of unique names object class instead. And in either case, you may have edge of member as well. Using group of names and edge of member would allow a few different attributes to be used for groups. The has member attribute contains the names of subjects that are members of the group. The is member of attribute contains the names of groups that a group is a member of. The member attribute contains the DNs of subjects that are members of the group. Uh, this is the same as the member attribute in the AD. Um, and the member of attribute for groups are also provisioned in the default configuration. It contains the DNs of groups that a group is a member of. And for member objects, you can have uh, is member of which contains the names of groups that the subject is a member of and member of which is similar to AD and contains the DNs of groups that the subject is a member of. In Grouper groups can have a description attribute as well as any custom attribute that you may uh, want to define. Any group attribute in Grouper can be provisioned to an attribute in LDAP. For instance, a group's description may be kept in the description attribute in LDAP. 
If you have an attribute in Grouper that's not synced to LDAP, uh, you should probably check with your Grouper administrator. Another important thing to know about your LDAP environment is whether flattened memberships are provisioned or direct memberships only. This may be another question that can be answered by your Grouper administrator, but the difference may influence how you make membership queries. If flattened memberships are provisioned, then if one group is a member of another group, the first group's membership list in LDAP will contain the members of both the first group and second group. This would be done as part of the provisioning process. But if only direct memberships are provisioned and a group has another group as a member, then the first group will not have members of the second group in its membership list unless they happen to be members of the first group too. Uh, but the first group will still have the second group's DN in its member list. Uh, but you have to take that into account because depending on how you query LDAP, members of the second group may not appear to be members of the first group since their membership would be indirect in LDAP. Also note that in some directories like AD um, and the Oracle directory server, if you want to get all groups of a person, there are ways you can perform the query so that they would return all direct and indirect memberships. This would be useful to avoid multiple queries, otherwise you would have to get the direct groups first then requery to see if those groups are member of other groups, and if they are, then requery again, and so forth. Um, and that can become expensive. So here are just a few tips on performing group-related queries. First of all, you should be sure to set your search base and scope correctly. The search base defines a DN or location in the directory where the search will start. The scope can either be base, one, or subtree. Uh, base will search the search base object only. With a scope of one, you're searching for objects directly under the search base. Um, and with subtree, you're searching the search base and everything under it. So for instance, if you have a bushy structure and you want to get all groups directly under OU equals groups, then you would specify OU equals groups as the search base and one as the scope. Another example is if you want to get all members of a group. You would specify the group's DN as the search base, and the scope would be base or subtree would work as well. The next tip here is to be aware of client and server limits. Uh, for instance, both the client and server can have a size limit that would restrict the number of entries that would be returned by the LDAP in a single query. Uh, there can be other limits as well, like a time limit, for how long it takes for a query to run. Finally, if your LDAP has flattened memberships and you want to see if a person is a member of a group, you have several options and here are some of them. You can get all the uh, group's members by retrieving the member attribute of the group object. Uh, groups can have tens of thousands or more uh, members, so this is probably not a good strategy. Uh, you can get all of the person's groups by retrieving the member of attribute of the member object. Uh, once you do, you can look through the person's memberships and see if the group you're interested in is in there. This is a better approach, but it's possible that the person can be in hundreds of groups or more. The next approach is to query, um, is to perform a query where the search base is the group's DN and the query that you run is member equals uh, the DN of the person. Uh, the important thing here is not to retrieve the member attribute back. Basically, you'll know if the person is in the group if the entry is returned. Since the search took the member's DN into consideration, you don't need to look through the member list. Finally, the last approach here is to use the LDAP compare operation to see if the group object contains an attribute value pair. Uh, the attribute would be the member uh, attribute and the value would be the DN of the member object. Uh, now, I mentioned that these are possible approaches if the LDAP has uh, flattened memberships. But if they don't, you should probably first see if your directory server has a method of returning indirect memberships uh, in one query. And take advantage um, if it does. Um, as I mentioned on the last slide, this should be possible in Active Directory and the Oracle Directory server. Uh, so that's all for this tutorial. You, you can click on the quiz link in the video description to reinforce your knowledge of this topic. And here are some links you can visit for more information. Thanks.